I don't know. All right, we are live. This is the Beverly Channel. We are the Beverly Crew, I guess, and we are discussing John Verveke's Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, uh, Lecture 5, discussing Plato and the Cave. Um, if you guys would like to participate, uh, you can go to beverly.me uh, or is it beverly.com? <laughs> Sorry, Ben. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, don't me. Uh, okay. So, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're my, right. The website still needs to be updated, so it'll be at um, discuss.beverly.me. Yes, discuss.beverly.me. Uh, so update the website, yep. Right. And, or if you want to follow us on Twitter, it's at Beverly Me. Um, all right. So this lecture, uh, Verveki went into uh, Plato being a follower of Socrates and trying to integrate Socrates' knowledge into. Um, uh, well, in, into the society that uh, ultimately killed him. So because of Socrates' death from the people of Athens, the, there's, I guess, an indication that the Socrates system was insufficient for dealing with these types of problems. And so Plato's attempt is to try to Get his system, of, get Socrates' system of thought into something that can be, uh, I guess, integrated within society. And like that's kind of the thing. Like Socrates just did these like discussions with people, whereas it's only because of Plato that any of us right here know who Socrates is or what he did because of him writing the books about Socrates, like writing the books and using Socrates as like a fictional character to build up from there. But um, all right, so big picture then, I guess, and then we'll focus in more from there. Uh, I guess Plato's big picture is definitely the the world of uh, the world of the forms as well as uh, the philosopher exiting the the cave. Um, but I don't know. I, I probably feel like if anybody's watching this, they, they probably have heard Plato's cave before. So I don't know if we, we want to really get into that. Um, maybe uh, we'll just get into you, you it. Could do, you could do it in a minute, John. So, okay, uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, so with Plato's cave, you have a bunch of people inside a cave looking at shadows on the wall. They didn't realize it's shadows. But because that's the only experience they've had, they consider the shadows to be real. One day they are unshackled from their constraints and then discover that it was actually a fire casting shadows and people were, you know, doing soft puppets against the wall. And that really confuses them. And then eventually they, this person climbs out of the cave and sees light for the first time. So you have this enlightening of the, of the fire and you also then have this enlightening of outside and each one kind of breaks away the presuppositions or the axioms that the person operated previously on. And eventually the person goes to the outside world and again is blinded by the light, but then sees things more clearly and as they are. But as he tries and tells the people who are still shackled about the world, the way the world is, they don't have the vocabulary or the experience to even comprehend it. Therefore, they laugh and mock at him. So this is a allegory, uh, allegory to what happened to Socrates when Socrates did axiomatic challenges to people using the Socratic method. And people either reacted angrily or through transcendence. Um, and the society acted viciously and then condemned him to, to death, which is an anger response. But the transcendence one is, you know, the modern practice of mindfulness or the, or, or the modern practice of integration or even the modern practice of psychotherapy. Uh, these are all ways to try and revivify through breath through movement, through energy, this type of self-transcendence to move away, to build up our integration uh, where our own perceptions, projections, and align them with reality. So try and bring our everyday world of our experiences back from lecture one or two into um, alignment with reality. So bring that journey's distance between the two uh, as closely and tight-knit as possible. And then to tie that in with uh, the previous lecture uh, four is to increase the salience um, to the, so the idea was try and make it so that truth has high salience. That way we'll be orchestrated towards truth 
um, and that will cause a, a positive feedback loop that is adaptive rather than maladaptive. So a maladaptive loop occurs when uh, our feedback loop is moving us further and further away from reality, where our salience things that hijack the monster within us, our, our appetites, our... our right, I, I should actually, actually get into that, because that, that is something that will be... I think it's very useful. Uh, Plato has the conception of man as like these three beings kind of all in one. There is the monster, the lion, and the the man, the man himself, or, or the the reasoning, right. thinking animal. All right, guys, uh, I'm going to uh, bounce out. Uh, I'm at a at a wedding here, and, and all the guests are arriving. All but right. I'm bon already, voyage. Yep. You guys already know what I'll talk about, so, so all the best. All right. Hey, John. Uh, I thought it was to uh, the lion and the you know uh, the higher brain, the prefrontal cortex. I thought man was two parts. I didn't understand. I didn't get from the lecture that it right. was three parts. Yeah. So he 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 starts off with with just the 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 two parts of man, and then he introduces the the third part as well. So. Yeah, there's the the thinking man, which is kind of like our capacity to know truth uh, and to care about truth. That's the thing that's driving us to want to know truth, even if it hurts us. So, like, he brings in an example. If you're in a deep relationship with somebody, and then uh, would you want to know if they were cheating with you, even if it might damage the relationship uh, irre irrevocably? Irrevocably. Um, and a lot of people would still desire that, even though it would come at a great cost of well-being or uh, just enjoyment and a great cost of suffering and sadness. So that, that would be apart from the, the man and also our capacity to think in abstractions away from our connectedness to things, as well as um, being able to think about things under long-term goals. Um, and like what's ultimately for the better of us uh, or, or for other people, things like that. Uh, and then there is the the monster, which is kind of the the more animalistic side of ourselves. Like uh, if you were to use Jung or uh, Freud, it might be the libido, which is the the like childlike thing that just goes after anything. So like uh, for if you, you put that that element of a person in, under the uh, marshmallow test, then they'll just immediately take the marshmallow. So he brings in how for the man where you have whom cares mo most about truth and falsity, like wanting to know true things and not know false things, uh, for the, the monster, they care most about what brings pleasure and avoiding that which brings pain. Um, and it's not like these are always... Um, like against each other, like where truth always has to bring uh, bring pain or falsity is uh, whatever it brings us pleasure is always some sort of lie. But just the fact that the there are these two components of ourselves that are primarily concerned with these things and not concerned with the others. Um, and then he brings in the lion, which is sort of our social aspect that cares more about where we are in our community. Like what's our social status? Are we uh, well respected? Are we honored by our peers? Um, and are we doing, are, are we doing things that are, is going to give us shame from, from other people? And there's an interesting thing he brought up how the, the word shame that he's used, you know, that Plato is using is different from how we kind of think of it as like an emotional feeling that we might experience. He, he, he referred to pain, uh, to shame as the inability to gain respect from your peers. So it, it's less about the emotional subjective feeling that one might experience from that, that we call shame, but shame is uh, I guess really related to, your uh, and it wasn't even just like your like other people uh treating you in a certain way 
it, it was more like your inability to ever gain any sort of respect ever again. Like you do something so heinous that you are excommunicated or disenfra uh, like, uh, let's see, if you do something so bad or something so childish that nobody will ever give you any respect ever again, something like that, that is uh, the, I guess, like an ultimate shame. And so there's those three parts, the, 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 my, uh, the, the man who's concerned with truth and falsity, the monster who's concerned with pleasure and pain, and then the lion who's concerned with honor and shame. So which one are you, John? I'm an amalgamation of all three, as are all of us. Oh. Uh, the one that takes primary control might be, I, I guess, the mind. I mean, <laughs> or, or the man. Uh, just being more introverted and not caring so much about what other people think. Um, but there's certainly an element of the monster in, in there as well. Because something I, I've recognized with Verveke is that he brings in sort of a problem with pragmatism and, and maybe even like the pragmatism of uh, Jordan Peterson, where Peterson... Peterson's form of pragmatism might have that element of um, self, uh, what is the term that Verveke uses? But it's uh, self-delusion or, um, or bullshitting oneself by not focusing on things that are outside of our own control. Uh, like, that's the thing that Peterson brings up. Like, it, you can't worry about things that are outside of your scope of capacity. Um, and so uh, this you can, and it just ruins you. Right. Uh, this was actually a disagreement that, that both Verveke and Peterson had in their one conversation that they had online before Peterson blew up or anything like that. Uh, and that was th one of the things that they kind of uh, came in conflict upon where Verveke sees that there is that element within Peterson of self delusion where rather than focusing on things that are true, but yet not useful to one's own survival. So like in Peterson's book, he brings up the fact like, uh, what, ma what does it matter what I do here and now if it, in one million years the, universe, uh, the solar system uh, collapses or something like that? Uh, and, and then Peterson brings up, okay, so now we've discovered that this frame of reference that you're taking is one that is inapplicable to your current environment. And then, um, so, and, and using that as your, I guess, standard for uh, measuring what you're supposed to be doing here and now is a bad standard to be taking. Um, and, and for Verveke, that to is, I guess, too much of a element of self-delusion that can take place with that act of self. Uh, and I really wish I remembered the term, but it, 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 Verveke talks about it in, in regards to the uh, sophists uh, of Athens, who rather than worrying about truth or anything like that, they were only giving you the, the tools to get what you want here and now. Um, and, and so... Okay, your question was like, which, which person am I? So there's that element, uh, I think, that using Peterson's pragmatism, there is that element of caring less about the truth and more about what is utilitarian towards my own ends, which I believe is drawn from the monster. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm here. I, I, it's, uh, it's exactly it. So, so Plato divided the soul up in that way and also partitioned society up in that way because people tend to gravitate towards these behaviors clustered around his partition of the soul. All right. And Verveke talks about how we keep noticing this partition. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I wonder, right? So. Where, where do I sit? I think I have sat in various uh, different roles throughout, say, different portions of my life, perhaps. Um, 
Do you think yeah. one is better than another? Um, okay, well, this... I mean, what yeah, we know... Where we are currently, the honor-based, like, the lying element of, of us has kind of been killed off through uh, Judeo-Christian values. Be, like, within, like, ancient Rome or Greece or within Islam currently, um, they're, they're primary and like most of the world besides the Western uh, countries are focused very much so on one's own honor or like what you're doing that dishonors other people. Uh, say like if you were to say something bad about somebody's parents, um, this is like, a, a an extreme taboo to be breaking and I think like within the Western world this has been something that is just somehow been suppressed or lost or killed off or something like that uh, and it, it so I and to our own detriment so um what the I haven't read it yet but um Marshall McLuhan's uh, bowling alone it, wait is that the right author? But anyway, bowling, bowling alone uh, about how our individuality is kind of like damaging to the individual soul. Like in order to have a life, a meaningful life, one has to be with one has to have meaningful relationships with others and feel like you have a sense of belonging within a social group and are um, necessary to their survival or sustaining, like you're doing things for other people, um, for their own good and they're like providing needs for them. And, and like, that's not really a concern to a lot of Western thought, uh, like as much as like emboldening the individual doing whatever you feel like what whatever brings you you your own joy and happiness things like that and so uh, I, I I do think that reintegrating the lion within Western culture is something that would be uh, very much necessary as best as we can and, and in, a, in a good way too where because I, I think that's like one of the the failings to uh, self-improvement uh, like the self-improvement scene is that it doesn't integrate the social aspects of um, improving yourself because would you it, say that nationalism is a response of the lion yeah yeah I, I think that's a, a a response that does come forth that there is do, the honor that one gains from peers by being within a tribal identity like okay so what you're meaning nationalism as in like identifying as in the political trend that's currently occurring on the right side of the spectrum right uh, in response to the kind of perceived threats that are coming from the left right um it, it, I, I think there is an element that's like that <laughs> but i don't know if it even has a good like it well, seems to only be feeding the line within one's own self. It's not actually uh, communicating that line with others. So, like, how I think of the line is actually interacting within a community where you do have that feedback uh, that, uh, that, that can be gained from, like, oh, you did this one thing and <coughs> ignore that. Or, oh, you did this other thing. I'm going to applaud that. Give you Say, hey, good job. That, that's, like, where you can enter... Not, not a flow state exactly, but at least have these mechanisms for telling you what you're doing that's good and what you're doing that's not so great. Um, whereas with nationalism, you can identify with, say, the American people, but I don't know how much you're actually going to be getting any sort of feedback through that unless you're going to these political rallies, I guess. That, that could be one way in which you're gaining some sort of... Um, you're feeding that social animal within you by becoming part but of the larger group. Nationalism isn't just like, say, the political rallies that are occurring. And it, it certainly isn't just be, uh, confined to the American 
uh, all the political landscape right now. It's it's uh, it's pretty broad response. It looks like kind of a reactionary response, um, certainly across Europe. I mean, good grief, go surf the European YouTube for a little while. Um, but the, <laughs> the uh, I, th I think from the perspective of, of Plato, from the perspective of the, you, are you, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> you, your, your camera went fuzzy for a second. It does that sometimes. And I was oh, it, I probably, yeah, it probably went out of frame or something. Um, so from the perspective of Plato and from the perspective of understanding that uh, we have these, uh, there's a general separation of something within the soul that governs our behavior mm -hmm. and that that writ large on society uh, allows uh, allows us to kind of see how the the, the behaviors of culture uh, are kind of the same right. as the behaviors of the individual so when we look inside us what we see are appetites and desires and and that's that is this uh, kind of lower uh, creature, the, the monster, right? The the thing that always wants to grow larger. And there's a bunch of them. It's not just one, actually. We've learned that we can partition it even further. There's a lot of little monsters in our brain that, that just want to grow, right? And if we feed them, they will. Hmm. This is, uh, we call them habits or whatever, right? It's, it's a very interesting phenomenon. But um, then you have other things on top of that that regulate those behaviors. And there's a, there's a broad spectrum of those behaviors, like morals, mores, you can call them a lot of different things, but uh, it's just something as simple as saying, I, I should modulate my ego because nobody likes a jerk, right? Right. That is telling one part of your brain, the ego, this appet appetite to love itself. You know, I need to cool you down a little bit, right? It's a regulator. Mm -hmm. So it's reactionary in some sense to this appetitive uh, consumption, right? This overstep, of, so to speak. It's a it's a an attempt to seek a balance, and right. I think he envisioned this as like this this struggle between these three things all the time. Because over and above that, you're supposed to have the reasoning man that guides the balance between these two things. <clears throat> oh yeah. Theoretically, but, that's the integral. Yeah, that, that actually brings in, like, even though Verbeek doesn't go into this as much, the, the Plato's book, the, the Republic, goes directly into these, like, three different components of a person. And exactly like what you had said, how, uh, like, the these three subcomponents to a human soul is also indicative of, like, the greater society that that one person uh, exists within. Like, if they're, uh, they're appetitive, uh, monster is taking control over their own lives. You can see that, oh, this is a, uh, th they are, they themselves are somewhat of a reflection of the society that they live within because mm -hmm. it's only within a society that could allow such a person to exist would, could exist. So like if uh, you're you know, in the same way that it's only like, you know, it's only in a jungle that a tiger could exist. Right. Right. So like if you're in authoritarian Japan, I don't know what I did to my camera, but now it's all fuzzy. So, yeah, I think it just passed on to me. Uh, uh -huh. Like if you're in authoritarian Japan, then you couldn't have that individualistic, free spirited, uh, hippie type uh, feeling. But you might have somebody that is more like very uh, self aggressive or, or something like that. And mm -hmm. like a person in that society would be a reflection of the greater society that they live within. Whereas over here you get uh, a, a societal uh, illnesses taking place within the conscious or the psyche of the, the individual person within it. Um, but anyway, yes. So with well, in, so in, in general, just to generalize, because I love to do that. Mm -hmm. um, what we're talking about is it, what are some of the necessary aspects of kind of like self-organizing, self reflecting behaving organisms essentially right because so he's, he's constantly talking about the, the manner in which we are observing the world taking in that information and uh, trying to uh, refine it right and see if it matches even more accurately as best we can uh, what we're experiencing 
Yeah, and, and I wanted to bring in like in the book, the Plato's Republic. It goes into how, in, in order to have a well structured, well structured person, you kind of have to have a well structured society. But also, like you have to have each of these different sub components working in tandem with each other, uh, rather than like, oh, my appetitive creature is working towards its own goals while the, uh, the the man who's focusing on truth and rationality and things like that, they're focusing on their own goals and then they're coming in clash with each other. That drawing forth some sort of, uh, I guess, meaning crisis with, within the individual themselves, uh, as well as like with social, like you're going to have all these discombobulated drives towards different things and, and being unable to attain any of those things. And so I, I think that's why Plato places the philosopher king as the uh, er, uh, a, as the authoritarian governor of the guide the of the chariot. State. Because yeah, yeah. yes, because they are the ones that are capable of seeing where things go. Like, what should I be feeding the appetite of monster right now, or should I suppress it somewhat? Or, or direct it towards some other thing. Because that's the thing, like, any of our different desires can be directed in one way or the other, but you have to have some idea of, like, okay, I know that if I direct them towards that, that's going to have long-term detrimental uh, effects, so I'm going to instead direct them towards this other thing um, that is for the best. But that, it, it, I, I think the, the excellent point being made by Plato is that in order to do this fruitfully, then the the philosopher king or the man within one's own uh, psyche has to has to, I guess, really care about these other things that aren't it themselves. Like you can have the like individualistic, egoistic uh, idea of rationality that will do whatever they want, or will will only seek out things that better themselves, um, and, and it could even be like a good pointer out uh, <laughs> uh, well, of the flaw of, oh, did I mute myself? No, I turned off my camera. <laughs> uh, it could be a, it, itself a, a flaw to Plato's ideal republic yeah. in that yeah. somebody yeah. who is a philosopher king will be unable to uh, best realize what would be best for other people or may be unable to allow their their own rational self to take full control because they're they're going to have their other desires and drives also working towards them well so in in any well-behaving political organization or in any well-behaving organism you have to have these three things essentially that's what it comes down to and that there are these there are these unique problems if any of the three get out of whack get out of balance if they take over too much right and uh, right. th those those imbalances represent certain kinds of uh, profiles, personality profiles we would think of today. Let's say like uh, preferences that that you the way in which you interact with the world because of the dominance of whatever is going on inside. Right. I actually <laughs> wanted to uh, ask you because this uh, there was elements of this that somewhat could map onto your um, McGill Christian worldview of the bicameral brain. Uh, but there, I don't know, it seems like this might be a higher resolution conception than uh, the bicameral mind. And I don't know if you, I don't know if you wanted to uh, go into that, like whether this <laughs> or is something Kind of distinct. Yeah. So here's here's what's really interesting about this. We we were talking about this in uh, our last conversation. Like, what is who who's asking the questions? Right. When you ask yourself a question, who's asking what? Right? right. The only way a conversation can take place is if there's two somethings. Right. That that other like it doesn't. There's no logical sense to to make of a thing talking to itself. So there are at least two things needed. For rationality to occur, I believe. Right. So, because like, when you, ask a question, mm -hmm. when you ask a question, it's like an an a priori admittance that you don't know everything. And so, if like one 
hemisphere is all about knowing facts and things like I know, I know this for to even have a question being raised that there's a indication that no, you don't know this or you don't know this to its fullest extent. Yeah. Well, I mean, think about if you think about the way the the way the brain is set up and the way that the information is being sent back and forth between the two hemispheres, they're constantly kind of checking uh, each other's data, essentially. Right. And so there is a there's a uh, we experience it now verbally and even in a, a much higher level abstract way as questions occurring in a kind of linear monologue in our mind. But in, in reality, it seems to be this kind of swapping of sense data and abstract notions assembled from that back and forth between these two hemispheres, these two slightly different ways of seeing the world, let's say, right? And so that is those two, th those two hemispherical um, conversations are tied up into the reasoning man Right. That's right. That's that's the um, that's the neocortex, essentially. And then much of that uh, control structure, that in, in, inhibitory um, neural network that is designed to um, modulate primal behaviors from before. Right. right. So that, that that conversation that was being had before the reasoning man took place was this kind of violent clash between you know, whatever is controlling appetite before. Oh, right. so that, that makes sense. And so the, I, I like Plato's conception because it, it gives me like three different, I uh, guess, metrics to, to consider things upon with truth and falsity, um, honor and shame, and then pain and pleasure. Uh, but that makes sense. Like in order to have the truth and falsity uh, man with, within one's own soul, then you have to have the, I guess, the bicameral mind of one thing, seeing everything as interconnected, and this other side that sees everything as being atomized and individuated, or not individuated, but I individual components that are the things in themselves. Um, and then, like, along with that, it, the capacity to question things. So that, that okay, that, that yeah, is, you know, what's really, what's really strange about it. I've been, I've been going through like neural diagrams and like trying to figure out how I've just been doing some crazy stuff, but like, it seems, it seems like it could be something is not, I'm going to say as simple, but it could be as, it could be as simple as, um, you know, when you, when you look at a branching n network uh, and well, look at branching nodes, a tree right it resembles a tree and um if you run a signal in one direction it splits the signal right and if you run it the other direction it converges so uh e if you have similar structures on both sides which is what it seems like hemispherically all, all you have to do is just run the signal in reverse on that same network and you get a different you get a different uh shape to the signal manipulation, however that's occurring, right? Hypothetically speaking. Um, so we, we okay, so it, I mean, like, we know that these, I'm not prepared to go into this. I'm, I'm sure most people are not really interested, but um, it's, it's really fascinating. Like, because when you, it, like, even in this lecture alone, when you look at the way that he, he, talks about the way that information is cycled through these systems. If you look in the brain, this is really strange. Uh, there's a, a thing called a Yakovlevian torque or torsion. Um, it, there's a, it seems like the brain is twisting inside our skull. <laughs> like it, as, as you age, it twists more and more and it pushes on the, on the, uh, the inside of the skull and you can see it the form of time. It's very interesting, but even if you look at on MRIs, if you see the pattern and the way that information is uh, processed in the right hemisphere and then flows in over and, and to the left, and you can see it kind of move in cycles and circles. <coughs> it's really, really interesting. Um, but it's it's all about, like, it, it's, it's all about 
modulating energy, like the flow of energy that we store in fat, right? Mm -hmm. And then build up in little, like little dreams in our head about what to do. And then like doing it as best we can to accomplish it. Like that's really weird, right? But it's, it's not that it's not even that what you did was good enough. It's that you that there's there is even there a sense that you can do better than what you just did to achieve what you wanted to achieve. Right. That's actually good because uh, there was this other lecture I listened to of Plato and Aristotle uh, from a like a Christian perspective, actually. Uh, and he brought it in this good understanding of Plato's, uh, I guess, ontology or metaphysics of considering th th like that you have the two worlds, which um, Verbeke brings up at the beginning of this, but the how he describes the two worlds is you have the world of being and you have the world of becoming. So being is that of like reality, ultimate reality, the, the, the ideal forms, the patterns, like you have a perfect circle up there. Whereas if you were to try, try to draw a circle down here, you would have a, a close approximation to the perfect circle. Um, but it would never be that ideal thing itself. Or like you could say the laws of nature, uh, like the, the patterns of nature would be an ideal form that's within Plato's conception of the forms. And like when we, when we see, yeah. no, it's, what's interesting, falling, uh -huh. what's interesting about this. It's, it's, and it's the strange nature of like time too, right? Like, um, we're always in the present. Right. Um, right. That, that was actually something, a part of our uh, private conversation that you and I had with somebody I talked to on Twitter is that it, for change to occur, there's has to be some sort of like motion or, or and, I, and I think that fits well with the world of becoming like you're never at a certain state. You're always either becoming something or you're losing something. You're the yeah. gaining something or losing something. So this is what's or, so strange about this. this. About different things. Being that which is not you is the other. It's the picture that you see that you move towards. Right. That's right. So weird, right? Like it's it's you can never be what you are moving towards, what you desire to become. You can't. It is always the other. It's something outside of you. That, and that is, in fact, how it, like... Right, that was something we brought up. objective gets defined. That's something we brought up where, like, you're, you're never going to reach... You're never going to reach the future. The future is always defined according to where you are right now as something ahead of you. Same for the past. Like, you're... I'm not in the past right now. I'm in the present, whereas five minutes... From now, uh, I'll, I'll still be in the present, and that thing back there that no longer is will be the past. Uh, yeah. and, and just like what you were saying, there's the ideal that is outside of our grasp is, I, I, I guess, yeah, always going to be outside of our grasp. But it, it there's this, um uh, something that Verbeke brought up in like uh, four minutes in where, whereas the Hebrews gave a historical analysis of the two world hypothesis where one is moving, like you're, where you are in the present is kind of unbearable, but where you're going into the future, that is the ideal world, the promised land that you're going to attain through your actions in the here and now. That's the Hebrew conception of the axial age. Plato is instead using a scientific answer drawing from the natural philosophers of the times like Pythagoras. Uh, whereas the, he's describing like the ontology of reality as these two worlds. You have the world of being, which is where we are currently, the, the material kind of way of going about things where things dec uh, become decrepit, things like you draw a, a triangle and it's not exactly perfect. Um, uh, like, and then you have the, the, the world of being where I guess our reality rests upon because like <coughs> in order for anything to really exist, it's yeah. there has to be something giving it, it it's there has to be something giving its form, its structure, its uh, capacity to function. 
um, like you, you, imagine imagine a flower, mm-hmm. okay, like a wilted flower. Now make it lively, right? Mm-hmm. How nice is it in your mind? Like how nice did you make it? Can you make it nicer? Can you make Go it ahead, more? Can you make it more beautiful? What are you doing when you do that? Mm. Like what? What is that sense? It's very strange, and it, like almost anyone can do it, right? You can it, we we can do this process where we just try to make things nicer like we can envision things that are nicer and this is hotly contested in biology because it smacks of you know the divine and god and all that and spiritual stuff but but that's what you know if you believe in evolution that's what evolution did yeah but, but, so you see know, over time it's just insane like the idea of beautifying something like you 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 have like a dirty room and then there's ways you can go about cleaning it and there's ways of even making it not just useful but also making it beautiful in some way like by creating something aesthetically pleasing that yeah. serves no utilitarian function yeah so what's really interesting about this is when you look at when, when you look at it with completely unbiased unfiltered goggles the way that you do is like say a physicist would it's all just energy flowing around mm-hmm. and it, this comes in the sense of uh, attractors and repulsors, something like that. When it, when we're speaking of a, su- a subject moving about in the world, so I have things that I'm attracted to and things that I want to stay away from. Right. And that's a large part of what the hemispheres are devoted to. It seems like is figuring that process out. And I, I think what you said about evolution is actually quite quite funny because uh, it it really is kind of a truism that evolution favors beauty over irregular uh, favors beauty over like say asymmetry uh, as being kind of one uh one way in which a, a certainly efficiency is over. Hmm? certainly efficiency certainly but uh just and like somehow beauty sexual selection. efficiency if you think about what sexual selection is there's yeah. the that's what we experience it as you're right it's exactly right like attraction in the the part of reproduction is experienced as beauty attraction right that right yeah and it's and it's interesting because there's actually a connection there between the aesthetic and what is actually created or propagated where and, and even um heightened in some sense so it's not like you can say that our aesthetic sense or like things are only aesthetically real insofar as they're within the subjective creature because there's the element of evolution that is heightening whatever is aesthetically pleasing and then disenfranchising or downregulating things that aren't aesthetically pleasing. Mm-hmm. And it's actually like beauty itself that is continued. And it's not just, not just some sort of mental concept that we have that we're, we're applying somewhere. Well, it, I think what it what it is is it, is it beauty is a resource. That's how it's seen. Um, it, that's that's how we should understand it. I think uh, beauty is a resource. Mm-hmm. When uh, at the at the very least, like as human beings, when we see something we call beautiful, it's a visual resource. Like we, our eyes lock onto it because while looking at it, we are deriving some kind of pleasure from it, right? It's producing an actual response in our brain that is good for us, right. or feels good for us. Right? And, and that's, so it's a resource. That's what beauty is. And ugliness is something like, or, or hatred or disgust or, or contempt, all of those feelings is something like a thing that is not a resource. Uh, it's, it's almost like, um, yeah, it, well, so it's associated with concepts of waste, right? So we, we use scatological terms for all sorts of things like this, mm-hmm. right? Like shit, feces, um, mm-hmm. Like a, There's, um, yeah, so what, what's interesting about all of these um, systems, though, is that, uh, so if I, were, if I were a dung beetle and I see shit, mm-hmm. it's not that. It's like, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. 
because it's, it has that attractive power towards you. It's my resource. Yeah, I need it. I'm like, whoa, look at that massive. It's like a mountain of greatness. Like it's glistening in the sun. There's a fly on it. It's like, hello, friendly fly. Good, good, good to see you this morning. This is a wonderful feast. But, you know, me as a person, human being, I, I would get sick from eating it or, or you know, it's, it's completely different salience to use the terms that are in, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and that's like what uh, Verveke brings up is these concepts we have are, are not like necessarily in the things, but in their relation to other things. Like mm -hmm. my connection to shit is uh, a desalience or even disgust, things like that. So the, the shit is disgusting. Whereas for a dung beetle, the salience, salient relationship between that is like, this is going to get me a, a mate this is going to help me survive the cold there's a, a lot to this than just there's a lot to this for me um being the dung beetle while there's not a lot to this for me being the person now when you when you examine biological cycles and you take a look at this so we can we could close the loop pretty quickly by just imagining that people eat dung beetles right and there you have a, a closed loop. So we, we eat dung beetles, we we take a shit, and the dung beetles eat the shit, and then we eat the beetles, and that's it. That's, mm. it's In reality, it's more complicated than that. But there is a loop in nature. We recycle these pieces of ourselves all the way through the chains of whatever interested thing wants to chew on whatever they want to chew on, I guess. But it's so weird. Um, but all right, so imagine that cycle uh, occurring externally in nature and squeeze it inside your head as compartmentalized little uh niches resource niches in your brain mm. and and so that that's what we're dealing with in terms of appetites so your appetites are little neurological structures um that mm. are like a little dung beetle that has its own little resource right and it's waste product we don't you know what is the waste product of lust a baby Right. And and to have a baby, you need uh, control mechanisms, right? Like nurturing elements. So th that is a resource for the nurturing element. It, it's weird using the term waste from that. I would see, say more like product, but I guess like product. Waste, pro waste product. Yeah. So, I mean, I, yeah, you. Uh, it might just be because like, I mean, it's technically the same and, and that's how Concept, I use that. Yeah. Where, yeah. So, like, yeah. if 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 I'm if I'm being like, biased, I can call it all sorts of things. But yeah, it's it's a waste product. It's it's the output. It, I right. can say input output. I can get. Yeah, we can use all sorts of language. But you get what I'm saying. Right? Yeah, I, I got you. Yep. Um, and so inside your head, that's occurring all the time. And I think what Plato's realized early on, very early on, this is what's so fascinating about it. So early on in our exploration of of what's going on up here right like just seemingly out of nowhere we have this incredibly uh well understood conception this framework for this the human psyche and it just seems to to match up but um that's that's what's going on in here right that you have you have these competing internal resource uh input output systems and that you have to balance them out right so the neocortex is now uh, receiving output as you know it's an interest it's interested so um our <laughs> this new this new product built on top of the brain is interested in the things that the lower parts are doing right it turned its its it turned attention as it back on itself, right? And and that became its own resource. That is self reflection. That's um, know thyself. That's knowing thyself. That's closing the loop. That's so that is exactly, uh, you know. So like when the worm is eating forward, seeking more resources, rather than continue seeking more resources it opened its mouth so wide that it went backwards and consumed itself and that's exactly what we've done with the neocortex we we've, we've done that we've moved back and we went, went we went down and we said okay well now we're going to build these control structures so that what's going on down there uh, makes a lot more sense it's not so ridiculous because we like we keep hurting each other and it sucks and there's a better way to do it and 
Uh, I, I'm really glad I listened to this lecture because when I had read uh, Plato's Republic, what, maybe like a year or so ago, uh, I, I think I was misinterpreting Plato's three people. Uh, and I was reading it from like what I had known about uh, Freud with the, the id, the superego, the id, the ego, and the superego. And thinking about it now, there, there is quite the difference between those three. And I think like, yes, with Freud, it seems more like each of those three components are themselves sort of the appetitive creature, but rather than seeking after one's own like base desires, they are seeking after uh, certain other appetitive desires. So uh, I, I think how he puts the, the superego is almost like one, how one's own culture is indoctrinated into one's own brain. Like to yeah. be in alignment with the superego is to be like the perfect citizen. And so you're uh, doing everything that is for the best for the broader culture that you exist within. And that is like the, the ideal, well, that is what the, the superego is attempting to get at is the, the conform, is that the right use? The, the conf conforming nature of oneself towards the, the broader community. Um, and then for the, the ego themselves, I don't know, it seemed like from what I, little I know of Freud is the ego is that which is caught in between uh, societal's social pressures and then uh, one's own base, base desires for pleasurable things or sex or food or lust, any, any of those types of things. Um, and then like the, the ego is the person that's kind of stuck between these, these two combative uh, components to ourselves where in order for culture to uh, survive, it has to dampen and suppress the the baser biological needs of a person to just do whatever he wants. Uh, and in order for the the uh, biological organism that we exist within to, I guess, be happy and not kill oneself, it has to meet these biological needs in some way. And so <laughs> then you have the ego that's just kind of stuck between those two and just living in misery <laughs> i think uh, yeah so i think honestly what what happened was um what what freud ended up describing was um the the growth of a part of our brain let's say collectively associated with um following the rules yeah yeah if, yeah like um Yes, like sovereignty is essentially the, the idea. It's like the, the notion of where you sit. So, you, you, for instance, you can consider like the Chinese people today, uh, people who would consider themselves less sovereign, right? That this is all your polls tell you this. They consider themselves more collective. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a, you know, there's a portion of the brain that uh, correspondingly grows in size, let's say, or ratio anyways to the other parts parts of the brain that has to do with programming your own little uh, neural network let's say for the the moral structures like for how to, to how to encode for the rules about how to move, maneuver through society and there that's that in itself is a very complex let's say networked uh, node of of, uh, of behaviors inside the brain but if only one portion uh, grows, let's say, and not the others um, that allow you to enact that behavior, you get this feeling of, uh, I guess, the ego, maybe. Feeling of discontent. <laughs> yeah, the alienated self, let's right. say. Good. Yeah, yeah that, it, it, that's the one book of Freud's that I've actually read is civilization and its discontents. And it, it's so, it's a very fascinating, pessimistic outlook for, uh, reality uh, or so our social reality and its futures. Mm. It, it's yeah, it's well, you know, like, like Nietzsche says, everybody 
everybody uh, speaks from their heart, let's say. <laughs> yeah, the, the philosopher is rather... Uh, the author is something like revealing one's own deepest desires or something in, in what they write. Yeah. Maybe, I think it is the philosopher that he's referring to. That or says, as any five-year-old can tell you, it takes one to know one. We have these uh, wonderfully wise uh, statements encoded, even in children's sayings, I think. All right. Um, Submit, did you want to add anything to this? I'm sorry. we. I just, of... I just assume he's never even really there. I, I, <laughs> uh, I think he's listening. He's like, yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Tyler. Oh, first you, you know, that's reverse first psychology. Yeah, it's reverse psychology. Yeah. You've shown up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I was uh, I was gonna make a race joke, but I'll stop. <laughs> uh, Control your. I, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I want to come back uh, uh, at some point later. Uh, mm -hmm. I did have some feedback on uh, uh, what Joan was saying at the very beginning, but. Uh, now that it has been such a long, you know, route, you guys have taken, so I don't think it's well, even you, relevant because I, I think we've hit a stopping point at, at this point. So, it, it, do you still remember what you were wanting to bring up? Because we can go back to it. Uh, uh, just that uh, uh, you were talking about how the individual needs to, you know, take feedback from the society, and uh, you were uh, talking about, you know, the maybe the pitfalls of. Uh, being too selfish mm -hmm. as in individualistic right uh but i would say that uh, i certainly deal with, uh, with that uh, on a daily basis you know where people are selfish uh, uh to the detriment of other people but uh, that's i don't consider that to be a fault of uh, individualistic uh, way of looking at things neither do i see uh, being uh, you know uh, in, neither do I see individualism as something that takes you away from uh, the community in the sense that you will be alienated. Uh, and the reason I think that is because uh, uh, it's a failure of ethics, in my opinion, and education where uh, you think your self-interest uh, or you following your individualism is, uh, 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 you know, harming others. So if you have incorrect ethical models, then you will be hurting others. But you can be a very individualistic person and still have the kind of ethical system that you embody, which uh, makes you stop at a point where you are you know, hurting others. Uh, that's the first point. Second point is, uh, you know, the example of Howard Rock was coming into mind. So uh, he's someone who is... Uh, very individualistic. He's uh, very selfish in the sense that, uh, you know, he he doesn't care about anything or anyone else. He just wants to build the kind of, you know, uh, buildings that he wants to build. But uh, still, he has a lot of friends and he does have a community, maybe a very small one, uh, uh, but uh, a community where he can, you know, find meaning and connect with his type of people so uh, i'm not saying that you know uh, that uh, you i think if you really if, uh, for example uh, you have found a community john has found a community you know one guy sitting in florida another one is in australia so i, I think it's possible for you to be connected to people in a social manner and still be very different from uh, people around you and that's that's what i don't like about uh, getting feedback from your environment uh, because uh, john let's say you live in a certain part of america where people are uh, you know a certain way and uh, uh, you are more like maybe the guy who should have been at mit or uh, harvard or something so uh, right so uh, how do you take environment uh, feedback from uh, your environment i mean uh, to me uh, the social environment uh, I don't see it as a positive. Uh, 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 to me, it's something that if you, uh, let me put it this way, I would say most people are 
ignorant and if you the l- less ignorant you become uh, the more feedback you will get from them in the sense that maybe let's say you don't fit in uh, so to me there is a tension there and i i, I don't i'm not a big fan of taking uh, uh, feedback from environment to maybe mold yourself uh, uh, because uh, i don't think the democ- i don't think democracy is a good model because i don't think most people know uh, again that's just my way of looking at things i i don't think society as a whole uh, can tell you uh, the right way to live or uh, the right direction in which to go uh, uh, maybe that's true for uh, uh, majority of individuals uh, who don't think as much as you do john and uh, who needs to be kind of uh, controlled through the social mechanisms but uh, you know if you really want to be an intellectual being then uh, just you will be disconnected from society and for good reasons right so yeah you bring up a lot of good points there i want to touch on e- each of them uh just from the one that's directly from that last part um I- there is the element of let's see if for social improvement like it's very hard to be that atomized individual that has full autonomous control over one's own self so like if i have a strong <laughs> uh taste for fast food something like that like i love it i'll eat it every day something and i want i i real recognize the unhealthiness of this and and I wish to stop doing so it it's very hard to hmm, take supreme control over one's own like bodily desires and things like that that we have already acclimated towards like uh and, like come addicted to smoking or to fast food or something like that whereas there is an element that we can utilize which is the social component where if i put myself into a situation where i will receive communal feedback for um ascertaining my goals uh and and, and benefit from that then this is a highly useful faculty at my at, at hand that i can utilize towards my own self betterment whereas if i were to not utilize that then i would be hard pressed to actually accomplish many of the uh mm, hard pressed to accomplish the the goals that actually are sought after by my more base desires so like uh i guess just as a personal example to that uh, what like a month and a half or maybe two months ago i went off of fast food for a while and put up an element of money as well as m- mentioning it on twitter uh with the expectation that in a month i'd have to tell my progress for for what i was doing and i didn't even really do that like i don't care too much about what my followers think and uh things like that but it 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 did help in, in some ways to be able to accomplish that because if i had not this outward expectation from others that is like even just within my, my own mind like i don't think anybody anybody on my follower list really cared whether or not i accomplished these things um just by my own i guess that line within myself of knowing that oh i've put myself out there and i have to be true to my word whereas if my word was only good for my own like like i i have no i don't care at all that my word is disregarded by others like if i was that howard rorke and figure where um uh, and now of course howard rorke certainly cared about uh keeping his word but he didn't care that um others might uh not hold him up in a dignified way or anything like that. Well that um, I mean it's also the acknowledgement that yourself is not purely a construction of yourself. It's also a relation with your environment. And that's touching on Smith's point a little bit I think. Like you, you can't really escape 
Um, I mean, you, you may not want to be shaped by your environment. You may not, you may not want to be controlled by the democratic majority, right? But it, um, it, it seems to be a fundamental quality of existence that there is this great expansive other that's way more powerful than little old you. And you just have to deal with that. You got to deal with it. Now, if you are all alone, that sucks. If you're two together, it's a little bit better. If you're three, it's starting to make a little more sense. And if you can cobble together an empire, then maybe you can, you know, start to make the world a little bit better for right. yourself. And, and this is actually where I want to bring in like hard work because I think he ties in nicely with the story of Socrates, where Socrates had no real care at all. Like he had even such a love of philosophy that he would be willing to die for it, that he like he, he was willing to accept the uh, response from people that did not care for his style of uh, teaching. And I think similarly, uh, so like I can imagine Socrates as that Ubermenschian uh, or Ayn Randian individualistic hero uh, that is willing to give up everything so that they can without willing to give up everything without having to take a step back. Like they can, they're willing to take their stand and to accept the entire world uh, going against them. Now, uh, I, I can just use an example from the Fountainhead itself to point out that with, with Howard Rourke, the the world that was being created was, or no, within that world of Howard Rourke, the the buildings that were being created were become, becoming increasingly non-beautiful. Like they were following with the architecture of the time. A and because of Howard Rourke's uncompromising nature, the only jobs he was ever able to really be able to attain were from those who were kind of recluses and also highly individualistic Rourkean figures. So just thinking about it from, I guess, a pragmatic perspective, which I know plenty of objectivists hate, uh, the world that would be created through being a Rourkean figure is one that is less beautiful than if Rourke was more compromising. And and I, I'm i I'm not, okay, so there's an uh, element yeah, I see that I want right. to point yeah, out yeah, is do it, do it. because to admit to accept compromise is to admit that you don't know everything and there's things that other people know that you don't. And there's things that other people like that you might not like, but it's an element of, I guess, caring about what other people like as well. So, um, and yeah, there, I, I guess there's that. Now, these are, I guess, very nuanced discussions and I think that there is a valid response from that that I, I had thought of but I, I can't think of it right now but uh, that, that's at least one defense of the social aspect to to people is because people are not able to the, control themselves fully and rely upon these so, social mechanisms to uh, help train the elephant within us or the monster within us. Um, and as well that we are only one small subcomponent to the the reality that we exist within. And that in order to do the most with our capabilities, there has to be an element of accepting that other people are different from us and uh, working for their betterment as well. And I, I know within objectivism, there is that... Um, we can't all be Howard work. Y yeah, but also, like, okay, there the objectivist defense would likely be something like, um, we accept that other people are different, and it's a true act of love to... Like, it's 
to recognize that they have different tastes and then to benefit those tastes for that for those people but also for our own self like it it behooves me to bring about things that are more pleasurable for you than they are to me uh which i don't know it's it, it's, it's the objectivist workaround for uh for why we we aren't individualistic uh entirely i guess because we interact with people and we want the best for them like i want you to have the best thing and so i'm going to do things that benefit you even if they don't necessarily benefit me in some way just because it's, it's for my usually, own it's usually mutually reinforcing as well it, right. it, it, this makes a lot of sense right we, like we know game theoretically it makes a lot of sense to just share resources and right and, okay and so i guess bringing it back to socrates thing like Socrates, you could see as an example of a person who completely disregarded his lion self, or maybe there was an element to that that within him. But like, there's certain other like Stoics uh, or cynics of the time that completely disregarded any sort of social pressures or shame, like a uh, Diogenes. Diogenes the cynic. The cynic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like Diogenes the cynic is like the Socrates version of Socrates, who didn't even care about what other people thought at all. He just lived out in a, in a bucket or a vase somewhere. And, and like all he had to his name was a bowl. And then he realized like he saw some peasant kid drinking with his hands and then he threw away the bowl because <laughs> he realized he was being, uh, um, I, guess, I guess, sentimental with his material realities. Um, and then like also like he would masturbate in public <laughs> and like make fun of Alexander the Great, <laughs> different things like that. Uh, Okay, but the point being that for Socrates to be have that unflinching will led to Socrates' own death. Um, and so, like, we can accept that, okay, in order to be the Rorkian individualistic Ubermensch hero uh, would be to lead to your own death. But, like, is that the world that we're trying to create? Is, is, is that... Everything we create leads to our own death. Right. But, like, I'd at least hope that some of the things that we create will last longer past our death, which might be, I guess, a delusional hope. Uh, Everything we create will last past our death. Just wait, like that everything that we are lasts past our death. We just aren't in this form here. Mm-hmm. It's all still there, but the, the the personal bias that we have towards you know what our own influence is in the universe will evaporate at the same time. Let's say, or you can just adopt that right now. You can say that all of this is uh, either behaving intentionally, like you seem to feel like you are, or small portions of it are at least right. And it's just the way things are. Right. Okay. So this is actually good because like the only reason that Socrates exists today, the things that have lived on past his death is because of people like Plato, <laughs> people who Mr. Like, broad shoulders disregarded Socrates own like preference, not to write anything down. Uh, like Socrates was there in the moment talking with people thought that writing books was something that was less real than uh, actually interacting face with fa face to face with people. Uh, but it, it's only because of, I guess, Plato utilizing a less real medium, that being that of the book, and writing the book about Socrates, um, like Plato having that compromising nature towards uh utilizing a, a malformed medium to create to spread ideas uh it's only because of that the utilization of something in its non-ideal form or i'm using form there but not in a platonic sense uh using the non-ideal to garner respect from others or things like that it's only because of people like Plato, do Socrates, people like Socrates actually uh, last. And so like, it's only through people like, uh, 
uh, what was his name? Dewey? Is that uh, Rourke's friend in, in the book? I, I can't remember the exact characters, but uh, even... Uh, no, Rand wouldn't agree with that. <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> no. Howard didn't need anything. Right. And, and that's like the, the heroic aspect of Howard is that he could live an entire life without ever getting anything that he wanted because all that he... <sighs> no. Nope. No, that, no. Imagine, imagine that novel mm -hmm. where nothing turned out right. Like where he just stayed in that initial drafting job. Oh, no, 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 no. No, I, I'm saying like him going. Okay, so like that's the thing. Rourke didn't succeed as an architect despite like no, that. No, no, no. He, what he succeeded in was realizing his potential, right? That is what was so special about what's so special about the fountainhead of human progress is that it's this it's it's uncompromising love of whatever is within certain individuals not all individuals right so this is the problem that like we do this kind of kantian meta ethics like 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 that one howard work must be all howard works it, it's it's not the way it works right like you have one head two hands and two feet they're not all the same thing it, that that's six successful thriving organism needs different functioning parts and the psyche the parts of the soul function in the same way right you need these balanced parts that are occupying these realms of behavior that are kind of mutually exclusive okay. right that, okay that, that's a good point that, like howard Rourke did live the happy life f for his own organism like he was able to attain like he, he had no regrets that's mm -hmm. it um yet despite living his best life. Um, and also because of that Dominique. Right. Despite all that, Rourke did not, only created very few things that lasted and the things that were going to be of like his crown achievements never came to fruition because of the world that he existed within. And so there's an element there of Rourke rejecting the world that he was born into and being unwilling to compromise with any of their like bureaucracy or, or uh, b bad ideas or malformed c content to the point that nothing he did would last past his own uh, expiration aside from inspiration towards others, I suppose, which certainly I guess you could say the thing, same thing about Jesus, where uh, Jesus himself accomplished nothing, like died with friendless and in misery uh, or suffering um, without any hope past that. Yet, despite that, his followers went about to, went about bringing forward the Western Christianization of good portion of the world at least go ye therefore into all the world right so i guess you could conceive of a uh, of a post ending to howard work and that that little boy that he met in the woods somewhere that uh, uh he inspired at some point he became a howard work jr type figure and he found more Howard Work Jr. figures that were also inspired by him. And then they managed to create their own architecture firm and then rebuild Manhattan or something like that. You can conceive of that at least as a potential possibility, but it might just be a post you need your arcanum, right? You need mm -hmm. your your Gale um uh... Binan, what? Right. Binan, yeah. You, you need your, you need your arch enemy. You need, you need, you need the battle, the yin and the yang, the opposition of forces. Oh, yeah. So there's, there's always something that is the impetus for something else, which is therefore then the impetus for something else, which is therefore the impetus for something else, and it looks like the most stable 
configuration of that at the smallest stable configuration is three three things it's, and interestingly enough it's also true for quarks and uh, fermions and matter All right so yeah. I, I throw so, a lot of things out there submit um is <laughs> wait, wait. i don't know how, how how you'd like to respond to that um. <laughs> all right <laughs> okay <clears throat> Uh, so here is the thing. Uh, uh, I I see Tyler is right, uh, even though I uh, have pretended otherwise. Um, yes, the environment uh, does have an enormous impact. Uh, uh, that is why it makes sense uh, to just maybe move to another city uh, where you are more likely to find people. So yes, I uh, uh, yes. So in, in the one sense, you want to um, for the same reason, you know, people go to monasteries. Uh, they, they offer the best environment for their particular aspirations. Uh, so, uh, so that that needs to be looked uh, at and uh, you know worked uh, worked upon. Uh, so, I guess it would make sense. Uh, I guess I am. Uh, I we need to draw distinctions between two things. Uh, one is like a thing uh, more pragmatic, and another one is like more aspirational things. Yeah. So, it would be pragmatic to uh, I know I have issues like I can't control my these things, uh, impulses. Uh, so I might use social control for that uh, or uh, I might move into a this thing, a better environment uh, where we, I am surrounded by better people who inspire me. So all of that is fine. But uh, if you, but then you sh uh, shouldn't ignore the idealistic or aspirational aspect, which is that uh, uh, in the end, it's about uh, transcending, uh, you know, your environment. You know, that's what Buddha talked about, or that's what uh, the Hindu uh, part of Hindu philosophy regarding uh, enlightenment talks about. That you are engaged in the world, uh, you are doing karma, but at the same time, you are kind of untouched by it. And uh, I have never really experienced it, so I can't really describe it or just transcend your environment. Uh, so that's what uh, Buddha and these people were, uh, you know, aiming for. Uh, so you shouldn't for forget that aspect. And with re regard to social control, uh, the same thing applies there. I think uh, it's a crutch uh, that uh, to be in the interest of pragmatism, right? Or, you know, uh, you go to the war with the army you have and not with the army that you don't have, right? So right. while you use it uh, in the meantime, uh, it would uh, make sense to also work, realize that it's kind of a crutch and uh, ideally you should be in control of your that's the goal you know that's the aspiration you can't right. just be uh, using social control every time and going uh, uh, no, in regard to Tyler's uh, I, idea that you know democratic majority <laughs> okay so yeah, I, I didn't get that point from Tyler I'm not sure what uh, he was trying to get at with that. Uh, he, uh, only Tyler uh, knows what he meant, but what uh, the communicated concept uh, for me is that uh, uh, I guess you need to engage with the, the process and, you know, mm. uh, try to uh, build up a, a kind of maybe a movement and uh, something like that, but uh, well, I, you, I just uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, if you if you look at the the early uh, founding fathers in the United States and their conversations about um, what they were concerned with in the political structure and what would what would happen and how the uh, the democracy would unfold and this is this is a big part of it is um, how do you control the will of the majority and the will of the minority. All right, is one going to tyrannize always over the other? How do you uh, how do you ensure that the interests of each are preserved, and how do you apportion votes for that? And partly the way that they resolved that was through some technical ways, like the way that they distributed votes in the states through the Senate, this is the House. Um, but the idea was centered on the concept that. Um, if you get a majority of the population that hates a smaller part of the population, they, you know, it's nothing that the smaller part of the population can do. 
right. and you kind of get this runaway effect where you know that the the interests of that large group will always win um and and you th think of this from the platonic viewpoint as the kind of the appetites out of control and in order to govern that you need um you need reason to apportion how the various parts of society interact with each other and that is in fact what the founding fathers were doing that their their letters you can actually see them written out right there's saved in museums right are the reasoning the cultural reasoning element trying to coordinate the lower discussion going on between um the political left and right let's say which are the the appetites of culture, the appetites of unique individuals and their their kind of emergent behavior as culture, and the social pressures and constraints that uh, either uh, inhibit some of that behavior or encourage it. So Freud was right to a good degree then. And of course, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, that's why his that's why his work was carried on by Jung, right? And so, you know, look, look, it's not that everybody is right or wrong. That they're sort of partially right and partially wrong, and, and it's to... always a, yeah, it's always a give and a take. It, it's um, and that's that's what you have to like. There's no perfect solution because the concept of a perfect solution is in itself the thing that's flawed. So yeah, that is kind of like I, I see why you have Freud's pessimism is because like within his model of the superego and the ego. Oh no, the superego and the id always in battle. There's nowhere that the ego who resides between them can, uh, I guess, live a happy life in, in any way. So it, I don't know if that's a flaw to his model making or it's an accurate flaw uh, or, if, or if it's an accurate modeling of flawed reality, I guess. No, I think I, well, so, you know, this we can definitely yank in some Christian theology because this is essentially what uh, Christ was taking care of, I think, was the, the sacrifice of um, the atonement, this, this concept of uh, bringing at one, bringing back together um, when you feel estranged, when you feel that personal alienation right, that, that occurs either as an alienation from elements within yourself that you begin to see as the shadow or the other right that you haven't integrated or people externally in your environment that you can right. start to alienate from as you feel more and more as different or distanced to love thy enemies yeah yeah so there are there are these um yeah there there's these there are these things that we can do to alter our behavior to make our subjective experience as human beings more joyful, more profound, more meaningful. And that's associated with this uh, at one moment, this unification process, right? Like part of the conversation that we're taking, that, that we're having right now, right? That, um, trying to, to resonate is what it is and, and produce flow back and forth uh, where where resources and waste. So right now you're getting my waste product, right? It's my waste product. Just shove it in. Hopefully here. it's not shisa. <laughs> but but it is um, it is my waste product and and that's the idea behind anti-rivalrous games and such that that my waste product is is beneficial to someone else it's in such a way that their waste product is then even more beneficial to someone else and we just keep doing that back and forth. And so a good conversation feels like that. It feels like you moved somewhere that you developed something that you understood more. Um, a good uh, product design is the same way, right? You iterate, iterate on something and, and create something more and improve its features. And, uh, and that seems to be true for human beings, both um, physically in terms of our um, unique design over time physically and also culturally whatever that is let's say the meme space on top um yeah right and <laughs> sorry i think we kind of cut you off there summit just to explain that point that tyler had uh, uh no 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 it was, uh 
Okay. Hello, no issues. Uh, so, uh, 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 again, another point I had was that uh, when you say, um, you know, acting uh, yourself out, uh, acting out your values uh, can lead to your death and uh, maybe that should lead to you questioning your values. Uh, that that's a really uh, uh, I have I had no answer for it beside uh, uh, it being a matter of uh, say taste for example uh, if you uh, uh, have uh, a inclination to jump off cliffs and uh, with a parachute or something or uh, uh, if you have an inclination for uh, uh, you know climbing. Uh, mountains uh, with uh, with minimal gear and if you fall or die then uh, one might say you know wh- what an idiot uh, <laughs> right why couldn't he just uh, sit here and play video games with me right uh, or read books or whatever uh, uh, but i guess uh, 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 l- uh, let me put it this way uh, there there have been um, uh, moments where i have taken stand for a few things uh, uh, when things were going wrong and uh, uh it it was secondary as to uh what damage was done uh, to me uh so to give in another example let's say uh, some sort of disturbance is going on in the streets and a bunch of people are hurting someone else uh, so i have been in situations where i was sitting on a bike behind my colleague and uh, uh, when he slowed down the bike i immediately jumped off the bike and uh, uh, i was running towards the situation and uh, my colleague was trying to run away from it and uh, from his perspective he might say that well sumit what he is doing is leading to his own harm yeah uh, but uh, i would look at him and say uh, that's not the right way to live he might live longer but that's not the right way to live uh, and so when i go so you were the dung the... beetle um, <laughs> <laughs> no that, yeah that's a good point like and, and that's like the point drawn from socrates as well that like for each person there is something that makes their life worth living that if they could not have they would accept death so for Socrates, the unexamined life is not worth living. So like if he was unable to uh, continue philosophizing for or with the people around him, then he would accept um, not like, like it would be better to live. No, it would be better to die than to live a life without that thing that was most crucial towards him. And so, like you brought up with the uh, thing that he identified with. Right. And, and like uh, you brought up for uh, mountain climbers, there's those mountain climbers that go like, what is it? Free solo, I think is the name of a recent movie about that. Somebody climbing without any uh, extra equipment, things like that. So if he did have some sort of slip, uh, slip up and, and fell, he would be most likely dead and, and left out in nature for, uh, and yeah, it's, like you, you have to go about life with the recognition that you're going to lose at some point. You have to realize what is it that I'm willing to lose my life over. If you turn the Earth sideways mm-hmm. and flip gravity the same way, there you go. Uh huh. We're all Alex Honolds climbing our way through life. Got no clue, no ropes. <laughs> It's really interesting. Um, but we, we're, we're doing it in different scales. Like, like we, um, he's, he's doing it. He's pushing an envelope of a certain kind of flow state. And uh, people do that in, in all sorts of different regions of the brain. And he's particularly focused in the flow state in this kind of physical homunculus, right? That the relationship between enacting certain bodily movements in space in just the right coordinated way. Whereas Socrates was much more uh, closely aligned with the notion of the verbal communication of high concepts. 
and likewise a shepherd would be you know quite attuned to nurturing a flock or something right like the right hemispherical association of paying attention to these large groups looking for predatory behavior from wolves and whatever each person each like unique little niche of behaviors uh is it corresponds to uh just a different set of different strengths and weaknesses of of mostly similar brain regions so it could be something as simple as uh, like when sumit gets off the uh, bike and runs towards the fight uh his his salience is like that he needs to move to it to do something about it because his you know sense of justice or you know the the right mm -hmm. that region that he's built up over time that he's kind of nurtured with thought and or been gifted by you know whatever genetic ancestral history that is strong enough to do that Right, yeah. and that his amygdala and that fear response is not strong enough to oppose it. Let's say, whereas the other guy didn't spend that time, or maybe, 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 in fact, he drank way too much caffeine earlier, and his amygdala response was so heightened that he couldn't help it anyways, and so he saw a little bit of danger and freaked out. And you Mormons and your anti-caffeine rhetoric, <laughs> but uh, oh, that's that's yeah. not related to that at all. But. Okay. Uh, um, the, um, uh, right. Okay. Uh, yeah. So submit sees an injustice occurring and would rather live in a world where these types of injustices aren't occurring around him than one in which, wait, I might've put that the wrong way. Look, would rather live in a world where these injustices aren't, aren't occurring around him rather than one in which they are. And he does nothing. Um, and, and yeah, these are the the types of uh, anal what cost benefit analysis that we take part in, like every day. Yeah, and he, he talked about some of that in the lecture. The the, the right the, the discounting that we do over time. Right. I wish I, I had been able to watch that be part because only listening to it. Uh, I think there was quite a bit lost and I think I'll have to like re watch that part around like 23 minutes in. But it just draws a simple graph of salience and right. Time. Yeah. It seemed like it needed that visual element to it. <clears throat> there is something I wanted to insert, uh, 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 into your idea of, you know, cost benefit analysis before you get too far with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, like, um, I mean, obviously we, uh, I, I I think it's okay to say we so we do such a poor job of understanding you know why we did something uh, and uh, I was reading a book on psychology so uh, they have so many layers of analysis the genetic layer the social layer the cultural layer the cognitive layer and uh, then the, the actual hardware the neuro uh, what is it called neuro something mm -hmm. <coughs> layer so you can look at human behavior from uh, all these different layers. And uh, then on top of that, we have our own subjective uh, reasons for doing something. I guess you can call them cognitive, where we try to explain, hey, here is, uh, here is why I did this. You know, here is my reasoning. But uh, we also know that uh, a lot of uh, this uh, reasoning comes after the fact, like after you have acted for whatever reason you look back and you know you try to uh, put it together and give a coherent story of why you acted and i, I don't think i mean i uh, I, uh, I we should be a little skeptic of uh, you know that uh, uh, that's as well yeah. yeah 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 and uh, uh, but I, but i'll see uh, but you know with all those caveats uh, in place <clears throat> I, I would say that uh, uh, there is a part of it uh, uh, which is also, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I don't know if you can do cost-benefit analysis that fast. Right. So uh, maybe I have uh, <clears throat> thought about this kind of situation uh, before and uh, have kind of played the scenario in my head over and over again. And uh, because I have actually done that and uh, see if I will... Uh, 
uh, intervene or not or try to uh, in my mind uh, imagine that i will intervene uh, so uh, you know, just the way uh, marines uh, train or the special ops people train before a mission uh, uh, i don't have those kind of resources so you just train in your head uh, so there is uh, that aspect and then there is this uh, another aspect uh, of you know the what kind of person you are Uh, like i i see myself criticizing others for uh, uh, sitting on the sidelines and uh, not doing anything and this this is a constant theme uh, so over time you create uh, a image of yourself as uh, the kind of person you are so uh, if you have created a model of yourself that's the line uh, uh oh that's the line mm-hmm. uh, so if uh, about the creation of the line uh so if i uh, so if i am in a situation and if i don't act the way that is consistent with the model of myself that i have built then uh, that is like a death kind of a situation i mean that's uh, that mm-hmm. creates so much cognitive dissonance uh, that uh, action becomes kind of you know like uh, there there is so much force behind it like uh, to not act in that situation Um, would put me in such a big moral dilemma. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So I didn't, didn't understand why it's a tiger. So Tyler can explain why it is a tiger. Uh, why is it a what? I didn't understand why you would call it a tiger. Uh, Or the lion. Or the lion. Oh, sorry, the lion. Right. <laughs> okay. Oh, so <laughs> right, so right. your whatever your impulses are. uh the thing which governs them the thing which says the right thing to do that's your sense of like you said your your sense of who you are the th- the way that you're supposed to behave and you that you you kind of envision that thing and then you're presented with a moment where you have to act and then you're given a choice right and you feel it as a pressure like a sense that you should do a thing right that's that we're what you're you're describing there is as from the platonic terms you're talking about the lion guiding the pressures underneath to either confront and fight or run away and your lion was saying to yourself generally in that that sense if you run away you are cowardly right and if you go you will you will feel like you did the right thing and so you did the right thing and your lion therefore probably grew stronger that day like it that yet inner sense of the network that governed your control you you walked away with a sense of pride we would say that's another word that we associate with that i see uh, neural so, mechanisms right so you're using lion then in a more like uh i guess idealistic or, uh, sense of like our ideal conception of ourselves that, that like the Well, I, from a neural cognitive perspective like the, the we we have words to describe these feelings these inner, inner feelings and thoughts that we're having that's so that's what i'm referring to these these inner thoughts and feelings these cognitive states that we have are associated with the governance of these inner components and sumet's higher level description in that narrative was you know experience a fight have a decision about running to or away from uh he did the run to and a friend did the run away from right that's that's a great example of where you know the two <laughs> paths diverged um but it, that's that's what was occurring in his head there was a pressure to do the right thing right mm-hmm. and there was a pressure to run away and the sense of self that was to govern his right action was built up over a period of time and also comprised of you know whatever biological structure is already in place and the social structures to do the right thing was to run to rather than run away from but he still had the choice to run away from he felt that choice too right he said he was saying that he he kind of knew that if he ran away he would feel bad and we all get that we have a moment a, a moment of decision so when in when you enact on one or the other you feed it a resource right so um feeding the resource of the lion is pride i think that 
the gratification of that is pride, something like that. And feeding the resource of cowardice is something like guilt or shame. It's uh, that's not always true, Tyler. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, that, I guess uh, you're right. It's not always true. Uh, I guess John uh, was saying cost benefit analysis, but in the end, it I guess looks like more like a cost benefit analysis where you uh, uh, say, okay, if I don't do this. I'll have to deal with all these internal conflicts, so I uh, do it. Uh, but uh, I mean, I certainly, when I walk away from uh, that situation, <clears throat> I tell myself, uh, you know, once again, uh, uh, I have gotten myself into something that I shouldn't. And uh, once again, I have somehow survived it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, once again, uh, but that's your They're, rational self looking back and going, what the? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and you make a good point, Sumit. It's not like what we consider a cost benefit analysis where I'm like, showing you my projection and my, my graph with all these things. It, because it is more, I guess, archaic than that, where uh, it, it's something as simple as like, I have a bad feeling when to to do this one thing, but I have a better feeling. It's verbal. About this. It is. Yeah, exactly. It's and like you, we use those feelings to then try to create these abstractions and rationalizations for why we did a certain thing or why we should do a certain thing by using graphs and uh, <laughs> charts and things like that to make that that internal vague feeling more explicit through symbolic or not just sim but symbolic abstractions uh, and, and cost benefit analysis, things like that. Or logical syllogisms. <laughs> yeah. All right. I can move on with some of my other notes here. Um, unless one of you guys want to bring it up something, I guess, pertinent to you from this uh, lectures. Uh, Yes, I do, but uh, um, got a question for Tyler. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, I'm going to tell you what the main thing I wanted to discuss, and then you can decide uh, where that will fit in the most. Uh, yeah, so the one thing I wanted to discuss uh, was, uh, and I was really excited about it, uh, that uh, uh, the problem we all face of uh, uh, this thing, procrastination, not following through our own goals, <clears throat> like Peterson describes, not taking your pills on time. And uh, so Plato had a model for it that we have been discussing uh, the line and then you have to train the line and everything. So, uh, but I didn't uh, get uh, a 12 point plan. Mm -hmm. Like uh, he talked about it in general terms, but I didn't get that. Uh, I wake up in the morning, the step first, uh, make your bed, step two, you know, punch the wall four times, and uh, I'm—I mean, I don't <laughs> to know what the steps are uh, really uh, to train the lion properly and be this uh, person. Uh, so I guess there were a lot of wisdom in there, but uh, nothing I can translate uh, uh, to my daily activities and be better. So that—that—that's—that's uh, that's the—that was the main thing I wanted to uh, talk about and. Uh, one question for Tyler was, uh, then you have to decide where you, you want to discuss this, uh, was that <clears throat> this uh, thing about, uh, remember in the Gen and the Art of Motorcycle, uh, he talks about two models. Uh, one is the romantic model of things, uh, where we just look at things and say, oh, it's so beautiful. Oh, it is so great. And then the classic model uh, where uh, you have the schematics of the things what it is made out of and uh, how it works and uh, uh, the romantic people look at that and go oh this stuff is so boring and uh, the people the classical people look at that and say oh man it is so interesting this is how it works this is how the engine is uh, constructed this is uh, how it is made of and uh, to uh, so isn't that uh, the same thing as uh, the lion and uh, this thing uh, the rational self. 
sort of. It's more like the left-right hemispherical split, but it has elements of it. The 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 romantic classical split that Piercig uh, the, the describes in in that um, book is, I think, it maps very well onto the the um, the left analytical uh, preference and the right kind of uh, uh, synthetic kind of smeared approach to reality uh, that's also more associated with the aesthetics but it um, you can so when it, it, it really depends on how you look at things I guess because when you're talking about appetites you really are talking about like these drives these inner motivations the things that need some kind of control but it's the thing that compels you it's the thing that caused you to either run to the fight or away there's something that you have to layer on top of that, which is where your choice is. It's where you feel like your choice is, right? Like, do I or don't I? But there's that compelling thing underneath. Um, and that is, that is present in the left hemispherical desire to chop the world up into, you know, analytical slices using that knife that he talks about. Uh, and to order it, right? To cover it in order. It's also present in the right hemispherical's desire for certain resources, right? Both both are functional, uh, functionally equivalent, like little machines in your brain, in your little noggin here. They're just looking for resources. They're finding them through the eyes and the ears and uh, glucose and through the blood and all that. Um, yeah, they're always fighting over it, so or cooperatively working together to get it. They do both, I guess. Anyhow, when when you're looking at it from that perspective, um, yeah, it, it it seems to map more clearly to left and right hemispherical, and not as cleanly to just the uh, appetite versus the um, kind of spiritual moral restraint elements all right and going into uh your other question about how to i guess train that aspect of ourselves uh this it actually works well uh, works greatly into uh, the i guess the the aspect of plato that i find most interesting is like since we have these different components and these individual specialized selves that are capable of doing things on their own, I guess, uh, what is necessary is to craft a society in which each of those figures can be best, can best utilize their skills and in a way in tandem with other people also utilizing their their best skills in a way that's fruitful for both components so like in, in the republic it's trying to like the republic itself he's crafting is uh kind of not so much about crafting a government but but more so of crafting an individual like because you have these uh incongruent aspects of yourself that are all seeking out their own things. You have to create an environment in which for yourself, each of these things that the other versions of yourself are seeking after can come into alignment with each other uh, so that they can still be benefited through their acting upon their desires, but yet benefited in such a way that it isn't ultimately destructive for the the vessel of these uh, components to within the soul or in, in the Republic beneficial in such a way that it's not destructive to the very city that they exist within or destructive in the sense that it leaves them vulnerable to external forces coming down and uh, overtaking them. So I, I was thinking from these, let's say three, components to the individual's psyche. I was thinking about like, what, what is it th that 
utilizes these components to ourselves and what could be done to utilize all three in a beneficial way. And I was thinking like with Twitter, I certainly see how there is that element of the monster that is appeased through the use of say like likes, retweets, and for the pleasure, uh, the ple pleasure seeking principle. Um, and there's also the element of like, I guess, pain as well as a little bit of social pressure, not so much. It depends, uh, that, that doesn't happen too often. So I don't think that's r really, a, a, I don't think the lion aspect is so much in Twitter, but there is still, let's say the pain of like somebody responding to you, calling you an idiot or a dumbass or something like that. Uh, and then you can get into different cycles like that on Twitter, which happens all the time. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and well, um, I'm actually about to pass out, but I, there's okay. a there's a really interesting aspect of this that I think is probably central to what hasn't been figured out yet. I think, which is like, even though you can describe the self in this way, and you can describe society in this way as being composited by these kind of three central principles or sets of behaviors. It is not necessarily clear that you want the social structure to behave in the same way as the individual, right? Um, well, what do you mean by the social structure to behave? I, I'm talking about like the social environment to appeal to, okay. I guess, each three of the components. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, so that which creates a whole self organism like me tyler mm -hmm. um, the coordinated efforts of the the rational uh, man over the appetite of and the the uh, the spiritual um the the method of coordinating that at the individual level is not necessarily going to mm -hmm. be the same at the social right so metaphorically even though we are extracting metaphorically emerging into the social layer, it's not necessarily the case that that element of it will stay the same. And the reasoning for this is if you adopt a uh, kind of subjective egoistic mindset as an individual at the social structure, you do end up with a kind of authoritarian type. I mean, my, my liver does not get to vote on where we go, right? Right. So there's an element of sovereignty that's given up in that, and so the, you have to you have to question this. Um, uh, you have to question the relationship, right? Is okay. there uh, I, I th let me confirm this with you. I guess like what you're saying is that it's we we ought not to. I I, I guess. Presume okay. that creating stru uh, structuring society in such a way that is most uh, beneficial to each of these three components will and will cause these three components to come into alignment with each other. It might be that like I could create the perfect platform that fully benefits each individual component to a human being, but it might be that people come into it aren't really interested in satisfying their lion or their their man and are only satis interested in satisfying their monster and they're using the internet to like look up porn or something like that like you could say that the internet is the the perfect platform where you can uh, benefit or uh, appeal to each of these three components together uh, you just have to know where to look or uh, put in the effort to do so when it, in fact, like most people that utilize the internet, don't don't use it to its greatest degree. In fact, use it to somewhat detrimental uh, aspects or just for arbitrary kind of ideas. And, and so I don't know. That that's at least what I was getting from what you were saying. Maybe you were going in a completely different direction from that, though. Um, a little more generalized, but. Since much of our discussion does resolve, does resolve to this uh, 
concept of, you know, what we're building and, and what we're trying to create for the future. And mm -hmm. yeah, it, it makes sense to go in that direction. But um, yeah, the, 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 uh, all right. So more generally, what it is, is when I'm maneuvering as an, an entity in my environment, I'm using a set of, you know, like long, well understood algorithms, or yeah, I guess they're not really algorithms per se, but I, I mean, I know how to pick things up in my environment, and how to maneuver them, and I'm getting feedback constantly all the time. Mm -hmm. And to adjust how I eat and when I eat, uh, when I go to sleep, and, and all of these things, well balanced, right? That's, that's not true at all. It's not well balanced, but but it, it it's uh, there. There's an attempt to balance it, and it's all being done. And if I take my behaviors here and extrapolate them to society at large, what's going to happen? I don't know, right? And how can I how can I determine what set of behaviors for society at large are the best? I see. Now okay. now Plato uh, decided upon kind of just a wholesale extrapolation of resolving tensions in the self, just, you know, doing the same at the social level. So you get the philosopher king, which is functioning as the ego or functioning as the, the unity of those and a rational mind over the appetite of the spiritual. And then you have the, the warriors functioning as the kind of spiritual lion, right? And you have, these are, these are like, just, it's just straight wholesale, uh, you know, extrapolation, but but that may not be the case. Okay, I, I th think I'm getting what you're saying. So, like, I could take like my own insufficiencies as personal individual person, and then I could make the mistake of presuming that I ought to try to reshape society so that these insufficiencies aren't allowed to be exploited. So, like, say. I had a, uh, a drug abuse problem, something like that. And then from that, I, if I were to go too far, I could extrapolate outwards and say, okay, we need to legalize or de-legalize many of the drugs that are currently available. Uh, and that, that would be, uh, I guess, an overexertion of my own vulnerabilities and projecting them onto the rest of society when in fact it might just be myself that has the problem and by removing this element to broader society uh is ultimately too high of a cost as well as uh something that is i don't know maybe serving some ultimate purpose within society that is just unbeknownst to myself because of my own uh vulnerabilities to that product Partly, probably true. Uh, like, so I'm sure, I'm sure older generations feel that way about Twitter for like almost certain, right? Like, yeah. What horrible thing. Uh, I feel that way. Yeah, I, yeah, I was just going to mention. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, time will tell, right? It's time is the, um, time is the thing that tells. So, um yeah and, and i and i i, I yeah hmm. i'm yeah. right bed <laughs> i got you <laughs> anyway, it, it at least sparked something in my mind that i guess reminded me of uh your metagora idea and like tr thinking about how could we go about shaping a metagora that best appeals to the lion, the monster, and the man uh, within every individual person. Uh, in that active alignment of goals together into a singular focus, um, and well, I think the key is the, the key is that it's uh, it's dynamic. That's the key. So usually you have these um, like it's it's little pieces from all throughout history that combine up to it, but. Um, like developmental psychology is a little piece, right? Like piece of what? A piece of understanding how to, to create what you just said, the metagoras, right. uh, a better instantiation of, of how to guess. So 
So the the rational man uh, ruling over the appetites and the spirit. This is not a good description of a five-year-old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it is also not a good description of an adult that kind of maintains that, that like that the neoteny of, of five-year-old behaviors, right? Um, and, and I think this is much the case, really. But uh, what, what happens is that the various components within the self respond to the environment. And if the environment is ex is excessively authoritarian, you have a certain reactionary response to that, um, and it isn't rational per se, right? It's like a, kind of like a it's a mixture of the lion and the the monster, right? Like it's, yeah, breaking free of uh, authoritarian control. So. Um, what we see through the track of history is ratios of these different three elements in culture lording over each other, so to speak, right? Just like you do in the self. Just like you see in Neumann's work, how the history of consciousness tracks with history. It's, it's all very similar. It's all patterns repeating each other. Um, yeah, so that that's that's what's happening, and and what what we have to understand is not that there's a prescribed um, way to be, but that there is a set of responses to the environment that need to be able to adapt to whatever the environment is presenting. So, in other words, you will never just be the general commanding the chariot, you know, the two horses, the, the appetites and the spirit and all that. At some times you will have to be the monster, right? And sometimes you'll have to be the, the lion, and sometimes you'll have to be the rational man. And sometimes your culture has to go to war, and sometimes your culture has to be at peace, and sometimes it has to build up you know, communities, and sometimes it has to tear them down. Like there's uh, there's an element of that in 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 just what it is to be alive. But I think because uh, our desire to make models of the world and, and kind of organize it in the utopian dream exists in the left hemisphere, we, we highly associate it with these rule structures, right? Like that this is the way things have to be. And then that is very authoritarian. So you, you end up initiating this rebellious cycle all over again. So there, there, there has to be this weird kind of like, I mean, he Hegel noticed it in the, the dialectical kind of, a conversation of history this is what's going on this is this resurgence back and forth and it's not i don't think it's yeah it's not it's it's not best conceived as only a left and right conversation it's something more like the conversation is the thing that's traveling back and forth between left and right locations <laughs> That, that's really more what it's like, and that's your third element. But um, because, l look, you and I are having this conversation, and maybe people are listening, or maybe they're not. Maybe they'll listen to it later. But this is really now. Like this is the mo this is now. This is, this is existing. Like it's happening. It's really happening. It's really happening. <laughs> it's that's so. How much of it we're aware of and what we're paying attention to is so much a factor of, of like uh, things we had no control over. Really, like, I mean, you didn't choose to be a human being, but it, um, you're, you're, you're like this weird little entity that's siphoning information in from the future to the past is like the sense of it. It, it like you're moving through time right but you're not the past which is a, something like the the human body that's being built by this movement through time you're not that thing and you're not the future thing that you're not the goal that you're moving towards we established that in the start right like 
that's always the other it's always being is not it's never you mm -hmm. you're the becoming whatever the hell that is but that's what it is the becoming it's that thing that's passing back and forth between left and right location not the locations themselves that's what we feel like we are when we really stop and feel it it's like time passing that's why meditation is so important because it's paying attention to that i think that feeling like that we are not quite the things that we think we are, right? We're more than that. And honestly, I feel like when we, when you do start to identify with that third element of yourself or the conversation itself, rather than just these minor players or minor components underneath it, you, you experience flow and you experience, um, I think what, so again, all the way back to the beginning, what is it that Reiki's doing? What is it that Peterson's doing? What are all these guys doing? They're trying to reorient culture, right? Reassert meaning, find it again. Right. And uh, yeah, what you said about flow is perfect because like the last two points that I wanted to uh, bring up, is uh okay so flow is okay that i guess transformation of ourselves like you were saying with meditation it's like we don't do meditation because we get get something from it we're doing meditation so that we change in some way like it's not like me feeding this version of myself it's me changing from this version into something that's more capable of going through these types of meditation pra practices, which I'm not very good at, but, and I need to put more practice into it, I guess, or even some amount of practice would be at least something. No, it's because there's something inside you that has attached itself to the external world that you will not look away from. Yeah, I think I know exactly what it is too. It's sitting over there plugged into the corner <laughs> but it, but it, it doesn't even have to be that it can be anything it could be like like my children okay my children don't want to go to sleep because and it's plato's cave right you're turning the light out you, which by the way the modern movie theater come on that is, that is plato's cave <laughs> That's funny because exactly the Plato's cave in uh, the Republic Plato brings up or Socrates Plato using Socrates brings up how art is like the lowest form of anything because it's like derivative of a derivative because it's like the furthest away from the actual. I know. It, it, and it's so it's fascinating. It's it's like and it's it's, it's sort of a use of propaganda and sophistry because you get to craft your own narrative that. Uh, just anything that you want to happen. So like, oh, I can present this case where if you act in this certain way, everything perfect will. Shadow become. puppets. Shadow puppets, man. Well, shadow puppets. <laughs> that is funny, though. The, the movie theater is very much akin to the. Uh... <laughs> it's exactly the same. <laughs> and when you exit the movie theater. <laughs> it's it's the bright light. lights. It's exactly the same. That, that's the modern version of a uh, Plato's cave, Plato's uh, movie theater analogy. You don't, yeah, you don't have to do Plato's cave anymore. Just, just yeah. picture the movie theater. <laughs> that's good. Uh, but it's also like I don't know, somewhat intentional, right? Like the history of, um, yeah, it's, it's somewhat intentional. The history of. See, once you, re once you develop an understanding and knowledge of how the mind functions and how it works and what controls it and what it likes and dislikes, you know how to tweak the levers a little bit. And that's what people are doing now all the time, it seems. Mm -hmm. And we're, uh, we're like the unwitting, we're the unwitting rats in a, in a big laboratory which, with a lot of people just playing games yeah all right do you want to 
finish up with anything, Submit? Because I think Tyler's about to die over here. And I, I should get to no bed. Way. I'm immortal, man. <laughs> yeah, you, uh, yeah, I think he should sleep. I do get need some rest. So. Yes. Good. All right. Uh, I oh. don't have anything positive to say to you guys. I mean, I still don't have my 12 steps. Right. So, oh, yeah. My 12 steps. Okay. All right. You ready, Smith? You ready? Okay. All right. I have a feeling I'm not going to like this, but please go ahead. <laughs> yeah. It's not good. It's not easy. Love your wife. That's it. How does that help you train the monster and the Doesn't dragon matter. and the That's it. It's all it takes. It's all it takes. It, it's an organizing principle. That like there's um so this is why Peterson never gives specific advice, I think. It's always more fun for you to figure it out on your own, uh, even with the screw ups. But you need an organizing principle. So we, we just have to pick like an organizing principle. I just picked one for you. I, I you know, have reasons for picking that. It's good, I suppose. But um, it seems to make... We have such extraordinary machinery built up in our minds, in our bodies, associated with the romantic and, um, well, all of the loves that Verveki touches on, really, associated with combining yourself with another human soul. And nowhere do you get to experience that more intimately or more forcefully than in marriage, right? So that's that's why I say that. Like it, It's an organizing principle. It lets you set your behaviors around a thing that ultimately, if successful, uh, seems to provide the most joy for people. Also, potentially the most sorrow. But that's life. Okay, that was some answer. Finally, I have gotten some answer. It's <laughs> <laughs> the best I it's the best Usually, it's so difficult, yeah, to get answer out of you guys. Uh, that is a, uh, that is more like you know something I can say. Okay, tomorrow I'm going to do this. Yeah, well, we need you around more often so that you can keep on keep us grounded in reality instead of just going off off on our uh, abstractions and idealizations of things. Hey, just give me some, give me the news. What what do I do? <laughs> Okay, cool. All right. Cool. I'm going to sleep. Yeah, good idea. All right. This is uh, the Beverly Hangouts. We will be meeting up again next week, going over Verveke's sixth lecture of Aristotle, Kant, and Evolution, I believe is the title of it. I think that's at least like the, the thumbnail that I saw of it. Uh, so that'll be interesting. And yeah, uh, you can. Interact with us on the discuss.bevery.me um, forum page or follow us on Twitter at BevryMe. Don't you, we don't do that very often. Yeah, no. Nope. <laughs> Get on that platform, trust me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Goodbye, all.